The Secret Building is a building from the 1950s. It is in New York City, and it is the building that was bought or commissioned by the Seagram Company, which was a Canadian company, uh, an alcohol company that had been wanting to establish uh, a headquarters or a space in the United States. And so the building is by Ludwig van der Rohe and an American architect named Philip Johnson, and, and Ludwig is from Germany. Context-wise, I already told you, but I'll repeat it. It's a uh, Canadian liquor company patron. And the style of this building is from the international style of art. And remember, the international style, which we went over also with the Villa Savoie, is one that's very simple. It's streamlined, minimal decoration, if any, very geometric, and you know, lots of glass. That definitely rings true here with this building. But we'll talk about what makes this building very special in a minute. Um, the architects wanted to reveal the interior of the structure with the exterior. So it's not using the typical materials, which usually just to keep the building fire safe and up to code, you would have to um, encase it really in concrete. So that was more typical and that's not at all what they do here. And when we get into content, I'll talk to you about the materials. One of the other things that makes this building so special is it's really one of the first to have in its design an urban and open space. And instead of taking up the whole footprint of the land that is at a premium here in New York in the 1950s, the architects decided to allow some of the space to be open and to encourage people to gather, move back and forth in front of the building. Uh, and so that's always an interesting component to this. And it kind of opened up the door to other architects allowing for that kind of space as well as time went on. Um, because of the materials, which I'll reveal one right now is bronze, the whole front, that's why it kind of looks a little bit brownish, reflective beyond just the glass, <clears throat> excuse me but you have to treat the building with oil. And so they do that once a year so that the bronze doesn't oxidize. And if you let it oxidize, it will turn like a greenish color. Uh, you might see that in some bronze you know, pieces and sculptures and that around the area. So that was an interesting and is an interesting ritual. That's of course not religious when I say ritual, but definitely one you have to do in order to maintain the materials as they were intended. And then uh, there's a really beautiful tennis uh, kind of club building across the street that was built in earlier uh, times. And it was kind of an icon of New York City. And so the other thing about in terms of the footprint here is that the architects decided to move the building or set the building back so as not to overwhelm the building across the street. Okay, content wise, there is a phrase I want you to know, and it kind of is right up there with the phrase, uh, show me an angel, I'll paint you an angel, I paint what I see, form follows function with Louis Sullivan. Here you've got the notion of less is more. So little to no decoration, you're relying on other things, to be the interesting part. Uh, so if you simplify your design, the things that you do feature stand out and are emphasized and really have a strong message. So less is more is definitely, I would say an international style uh, philosophy and one that we deeply connect here with uh, Van der Rohe and Philip Johnson. So materials. Materials are so interesting here. I think that's what partly makes this building so important. And it is also what made this building at the time the most expensive building ever built. I think coming in at like $41 million at the time in the 50s. Uh, so it's bronze, steel in the interior, glass, travertine, which is a stone, and marble. So the classical materials, materials that go back to Greece and Rome, are the bronze, 
and the stones. Uh, and bronze is usually a sculptural material from Greece. So is marble, but marble is also used in architecture. So really this is one of the most classically inspired buildings in New York City, even though it's a building that's built in the 1950s. So that connection to the classical, and we'll talk about some other ways it does connect, is incredibly important. Um, steel. So if I took the bronze skin off this building and all the glass, you would see the steel frame interior. And the architectural vocab term you need to know is I-beams. So I-beams is, a, in this case, the steel beam. And if you have it in certain, if you have it vertically, it, in one direction, it looks like a capital I. That's why it gets I-beams. If you have it laid down in a different way, it looks like an H. I have a picture of it there right next to the definition. It is that beam that you are going to put horizontally, and then you're also going to stack them in the inside to create the overall structure that's providing the structural support. They're not pretty. You know, they're not meant to be seen. But what the architects wanted to do is to kind of mimic the interior steel beams, these I-beams on the exterior. But we're going to do it with bronze. And we're going to put glass in between the bronze. And it's going to look um, beautiful and be the decoration and be the, the texture and create the vertic verticality of the building. So that material and that structural I beam term, you definitely want to know. Now, travertine, the stone, comes from Roman times, and that wraps the elevator. And that natural organic material, in contrast to the bronze and the glass, it really, since it's on the bottom floor with the elevators, really anchors the building in that strong solidness of stone. And then um, the vertical mullions, remember mullions is a divider between windows, keeps it kind of divided yet also connected. Uh, and those vertical mullions rise uh, and create a verticality and they're dividing the windows and they just create this movement up throughout the building. They're not structurally needed. They're just there to provide a little bit of visual interest and to get your attention upward. So I wanted to show you these images to the top images, one on the upper left and upper right. Those are the in the lobby and you can see the travertine, that solid, warm, brown, rich travertine, that Roman material encasing the um, elevators. The lower right hand image is of the symmetrical public fountains that are there. And you can see that public space with people sitting there and in how the building is set back in the footprint of the land. And also you can see a little bit how the building's uh, entrance is set up, like the entrance is divided by columns, kind of like the Parthenon, like or a portico leading into a temple where you've got those columns and then you have the door set further back. So there's another way that the building is very classical. And then on the lower left, you can see a close-up of those bronze uh, I-beams, the ones that are kind of just not providing structural support. They're just providing decoration and mimic, though, the I-beam steel beams that are inside the building. And there's a regularity, a balance and harmony to this building because of all the repeating glass and bronze I-beams here. So that as well is another classical influence. So I know Khan Academy brings that up, um, the classical influences and connecting this building to the Parthenon and to you know classical architecture really, yet still then of course referencing the less is more philosophy of the structure. So function, um, definitely public space. That picture on the right here is a great image. We can see the columns, the entrance to the library, or the library, the lobby, and then that public space. 
So again, public space, building and that exterior kind of courtyard with the fountains, public space. And then I would say uh, for formal quality, you could do repetition. That repetition of the mullions, those I-beams and the bronze, uh, definitely creating that sense of harmony within the whole, which would be a very classical effect. You could also do texture. And because the texture, otherwise the building would be just very flat. So it gives that those I-beams on the exterior, gives it a little bit of three-dimensionality to it, which is going to play off the light coming around. So I think you could do texture as well. Space, you know, where you're allowing a very open space, and then the building set back into the space to provide that openness uh, and to, uh, I think, create a little bit of drama, too, as you enter into a grandness, really, to the building. So again, that is the Seagram Building, a very successful liquor company uh, from Canada starting to do business and have an identity here in the United States at the time period in 1950s by German architect Van der Rohe and uh, American architect Philip Johnson. <laughs>